welcome to the first chat from Sports SDGs. Um, today we've got Sarah Evans joining us. Um, she's going to talk about goal 10, reducing inequalities. So Sarah's a England and GB hockey player um, who has 127 appearances um, for both um, after debuting in 2013. Um, and you've got bronze Commonwealth Games medals, bronze, um, and then bronze and silver at the Euros with the GB girls. Um, you also appeared in the Vitality World Cup, the home one in 2018, um, and working hard now to kind of cement your place in the Tokyo 2021 team for the Olympics. Um, also a bit of a Surbiton hockey hero. So um, started at the club age 10, now captain the first team, and um, obviously you've won the league for the last seven years. So <laughs> the last time we spoke, um, you were still kind of in the GB, you were still in your bubbles, but now you've got kind of all the girls back together. And you've yeah, back the, band, band, the band is back together. <laughs> How's it going? Having kind of proper yeah. training and... No, it's great. Um, it was so nice being back on the pitch with everybody. Uh, before we were sort of, you could see each other leave in the cars as you drive past, you'd um, sort of give a little wave and um, see each other from afar. So it was so nice to actually um, be on the pitch training with everybody together. Um, so that was good, but we, we only did that for, I think there was only one week when we actually trained fully together and then we've had two weeks um, sort of rest and recovery before uh, the dreaded fitness testing we have coming up. Um, and then pretty much from then that's back in the game, sort of what we've been doing so far was easing us back into training so that obviously with the many weeks we had off when we come back that we didn't pick up any injuries and we're just making sure that we get back to fitness gradually. Um, so once we go back, that will be us preparing for our matches. Hopefully, fingers crossed, uh, we've got some uh, international matches with the Pro League um, in October against um, Holland and Belgium. Uh, but obviously, we're not sure 100% that will go ahead. We're preparing as it is. Um, so that'll be good to, to have some real focus around training and um, get back to preparing as we were doing before the Olympics and starting our sort of Olympic preparations again. So um, it's good to feel like it's sort of getting back to normal. Yeah, hopefully there'll be, be some hockey for us to, to watch as well. Um, so you're now wanting to get into kind of creating positive social change through sport. And you got first pick of all the sustainable development goals. Um, you chose goal 10, so reducing inequalities. Obviously, this is kind of a really prevalent issue at the moment with everything going on in kind of the U.S., um, Jacob Blake, George Floyd, um, sports organisations and kind of players taking a stand, boycotting. Um, but why did you choose Goal 10? Um, so for me, I've always been interested um, sort of in human rights, um, civil rights in America in particular. Um, I did, I studied history at university and so I have a degree in that. And um, a lot of that was around American history and politics and also apartheid in South Africa so um, sort of me as a whole I've got me as the athlete but then also this real interest in um, history but but equality and um, and human rights really so that's always been there in the background and then I think um, especially more recently with everything that you say that's going on in the world um, it sort of reignited that again and um, I think so many of us we've I know I, I've had such white privilege and really seeing that highlighted um, and uh, you know I've not had to experience any of the hardships that so many people do experience um, all across the world but also in our country um, so I really want to be able to to use my platform in whatever way I can to be able to help bring about change um, and so doing that uh, first and foremost within sport I think you know the, the numbers are pretty staggering um, and shocking about how little representation there is in particular at board level um, so I think we have a lot of work to do um, and hopefully you know with everything going on in it actually capturing so many people across the globe that hopefully we'll be able to use this momentum and really start to bring about real social change from it. Yeah so today I read a report from Kick It Out who are a football um, 
charity who kind of promote inclusion in football um, and reducing kind of racial incidents. Um, they've reported today that over there's been an increase in 53% in kind of racial um, issues in kind of football games starting at the, the grassroots level as well. So it's kind of is really prevalent. I think in the UK, yeah. we we don't think it's as prevalent as the issues in kind of the US, but it's definitely still something here. And you've seen it all, all the kind of Premier League players and cricket, Formula One, everyone kind of taking the knee um, as a stand, but it's still definitely an issue that needs to be tackled in the UK and kind of globally. Yeah, I mean, protests have gone on, you know, throughout history. If you think about Tommy Smith at the Mexico Olympics um, doing the Black Power salute on the podium, you know, things like that do really capture um, people's hearts and minds, I think, and, and do make an impact. Um, so, yeah, you know, Colin Kaepernick in the NFL took a knee, you know, I don't even know how long ago it was now, and yet he was... 2016, so... 2016, yeah. And he was banned from the NFL and, you know, had so much backlash because of it. And now to see pretty much every sport taking a knee before the, the, the first whistle goes, um, I mean, that's great that we've shown that progress, but, you know, how frustrated must Colin Kaepernick feel in terms of, like, he was standing up for it and, you know, that people, even then when he was doing that, didn't fully understand the reasons why and understand you know, how bad of a situation it still is today. Um, so at least we have moved forwards. And I think it, it's come, I think all of this is real, really come back into everyone's consciousness, partly because of lockdown in terms of everybody wasn't being able to do anything else. And then to see the dramatic video of George Floyd's being killed, I, th I think it, it forced everybody to, to notice and to, and to actually see how so many people are, being treated um and actually open our eyes to the way our society currently is um so then i think sport has a huge role to play within society um you know so many people say that sport and politics shouldn't mix but you know they are so inextricably linked um and so by making those political statements you know this isn't necessarily a political statement it's you know a human rights statement um but obviously it does link um that you know i think it's great that people are showing solidarity and if that is something that you you truly believe in and and uh, agree with then you know great to be able to use your platform as a sports person to um make that stand i think it's important to still back it up so you know naomi sako has been very vocal with um where she stands and um she um said she wasn't going to play in one of her games to that um that was postponed which is brilliant that she you know she said that she uh that comes first you know that she stands so strongly behind um that cause and um obviously then it was great that she was actually able to play but then you know she's still she'll do that protest but she'll still talk about it and still raise awareness i think when we'd make protests in the moment or you know lots of people do protests at the olympics um as long as we're it's i think for me it's about having the conversations so if a protest makes you stop and think well, why are they doing that then if as long as they're backing up and saying you know these are the reasons why this is what i stand for um and you can have that open conversation especially to have that conversation with with youngsters and so that they can know why these things are happening um then that is really powerful and that's i think where we'll get the change in it i think if we do if people were doing something just because it was what everybody else is doing and they don't truly believe in it then then i think it loses its um power so you know i think you see the amount of players and i think in particular in football because it is such a diverse playing field i think the issue in football is then going to coaching and the board levels that that's where you know the playing field is so diverse and then the boardrooms are predominantly white and that's where i think football has you know it, it's it's work to do but it's great that it has you know football's often been a vehicle for you know, all ethnicities to be able to um, play together. And um, so, yeah, I think sport can be such a great tool in, um, for bringing about social change. Um, and 
if a, a sports person is passionate enough and feels strong enough to protest, then um, as long as they back that up with the conversations, then I think that's really powerful. Yeah, I think it's great kind of athletes and some organisations kind of use, using their power. And today with kind of social media, it just kind of more people take notice and then hopefully will create change. It's just a bit frustrating that kind of what are we four years on from the first knee and it's still people yeah. still still having to do it to raise awareness and hopefully now everyone will kind of stand up and take kind of accountability for their actions and be more willing to step in and put other people right and kind of correct people and hopefully create more change to to obviously it's it's a human right so yeah just... and it's it, you're exactly right it's having those small conversations within friendship groups or families you know people might have different views and it's to be able to have that forum to be able to challenge people and actually not just have us get stuck in our ways of that's what we've all known and i think you're right social media plays, plays a huge role in it but it's it's also scary how it's great that that you know it's not great but the, the fact that George Floyd's death was was filmed caused such a, you know, a ripple around the world um, and a need for change. And and everyone, you couldn't not see it and see how horrific it was. But the fact that, you know, so many others aren't filmed and we don't then know about it or pay attention to it. So, for example, Breonna Taylor, who Naomi Saka has also um, protested a lot about, you know her death wasn't filmed yet so it, she had it has had a lot of social media campaigning since but about saying her name but you know the the police officers still haven't been charged with her death and i think it's it's great that social media can draw a light on it but we mustn't just rely on that because there's so much going on that isn't filmed and that we don't see that goes on and i think that's where why in this country we feel that you know Oh, America, it's easy for us to say America is so bad, you know, we're not kneeling on people's heads in the street. But actually, just because we can't see it doesn't mean that it's not having an impact on people on a daily basis. And that can be microaggressions. It can just be people's perceptions and um, so deep rooted feelings and thoughts and systemic um, things in place that will stop people from being able to achieve and barriers being in place. So I think yeah we need to be careful that we don't just rely on on the things that we can see in terms of the social media but actually use social media to draw attention to then all of the other problems that we can get to the root of them um and be able to to bring about full social change that you know gets to the heart of everything and um and it isn't just a quick fix change like this isn't going to happen overnight it has to be you know from the ground up changing things and and, and making sure that as you know people like me white people with privilege that we don't just turn a blind eye like we've subconsciously been doing for so long and actually help in the fight for this and it's not just you know a black person's fight you know or bame it's we all have to do this together um to essentially make that make everybody equal yeah and i think it's it's definitely kind of bottom up but it's also kind of top down so you have your players um, and you have kind of these reports from Kick It Out with the increased um, kind of racial incidents. So you need kind of governing bodies to also kind of step, that, step up and um, start taking accountability and making change because without people doing it on a governmental level, um, there's only so much kind of players can do and players can say and so much momentum that can be made without actual change kind of being enforced. So definitely in the UK, we need to be kind of putting in kind of stricter rules and just really, really taking accountability for everything, not predominantly football, but that's, again, the sport we hear about the most. Um, lots of different sports. It's unfortunately the same. So yeah, it's definitely kind of governmental, um, policies needing to be put in place as well not just kind of the raising awareness and the the conversations which obviously also need to be had but just all needs to interlink
yeah and and changing those boardrooms having you know the people who have the power and the influence so it completely yeah changing those policies but then diversifying our boards you know if we have more diverse boardrooms then we will be more successful you'll have such a more breadth and depth of of experiences and knowledge and that's only going to be a good thing but at the moment you know the statistics are again shocking you know it take, it's taken us however long to just be acceptable and i don't know if it's even being hit all across the board but i think you have to have 30 percent female in your boardrooms um so then you know that's just females let alone making that the most diverse board that you can have so to make sure that that's not just white and that's actually fully representing everybody in society um especially the people that play the sport so again like you say football gets talked about most the most but you know how diverse it is on the playing field but then all the boardrooms are white predominantly um so actually the people that are playing aren't fully being represented because you know they're not they're not fully represented by those people in the boardroom so no i completely agree and and it needs to be a whole uh, whole view approach um and and changing those policies will will be able to have that lasting change throughout society in terms of um hockey obviously it's a very kind of white dominated sport hockey costs a lot of money in the in the first place um so traditionally it's been played in private schools and in, in areas that are generally wealthier um so i think you know for one we need to make it more accessible um so you know going into maybe more underprivileged areas uh, getting into more state schools you know some lots of state schools do play hockey but making it so much more accessible the kit costs quite a lot you have to have a stick you have to have you know you want to have shin pads and a mouth guard it can be quite dangerous um so for us to be able to to actually make that stuff far more accessible for everyone i think is is a, a key issue um but i also think there's a lot of um cultural um maybe challenges as well with it i think you know if you actually look at hockey across the globe um it is played very widely you know um in asia like india pakistan uh, really really strong hockey nations and we we have a high asian population in this country yet not that many asian players actually then translate into the um the england and gb teams and just generally like being widely played you do see you know clubs that are um you know for example indian gymkhana that's that's local to me you know that's a strong indian hub but we want to be able to make all clubs feel inclusive and i think inclusion is something that is felt it's a perception so clubs can say you know we're open for all but actually if certain groups don't actually feel welcome or feel included in those sectors then they're not going to go and they're not going to want to play so i think we need to do a lot around breaking down those barriers around how people feel within the sport and we want to make it that everybody no matter what your culture your skin color no, nothing your gender your sexuality if you have a disability there should be no barrier whatsoever and i think that's where we have a long a long way to go with it um you know there we have loads of, of really good programs that like flyers hockey for example trying to get um more accessibility for, for disability sports and things like that are perfect in terms of actually raising the awareness that if you do have a disability that shouldn't be a barrier for you to play hockey and the same for cultural differences in terms of muslim girls and boys but you know you can wear a headscarf when you play hockey that actually sports do have flexible um clothing policy so that that shouldn't be a barrier but at the moment we don't see it because there's not that many people at the moment who are playing it and you know if you are a muslim girl you think well i don't know if hockey is available to me will i be able to wear a headscarf so um you know there's lots of things like that 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 we need to improve and essentially um if we don't see it we can't be it and i think you know hockey's not the most um advertised sport we're not really headlines in the media but you know we we are on tv we do get coverage so i think the more that we can show that we are diverse so that then there are more role models for you know every single person in society then it will it will allow more groups to be able to play because at the moment you look at the gb team and you see white middle class 
players and I think that is one of the biggest things that we need to change we need to make sure that there's role models for everybody in society definitely yeah and I think kind of sport is just a great platform for that because you watch sport to kind of celebrate people's abilities and it doesn't matter at all as you say kind of their gender ethnicity race anything you're just watching because you want to see great sport you want to see people kind of performing at their best so sport definitely has the platform it's just getting the access accessibility and yeah as you say kind of the role models for people to look up to and say they're doing it so why can't i you know there's so many barriers but we sort of touched on it before about um the barriers about um cultural differences and feeling you know like perceived um barriers and then other people making assumptions on how they might feel instead of actually having conversations with the groups that are um actually experiencing that lack of inclusion um and so simple things like um so brunel university um in 2019 were the first university to offer a hijab um as part of the university sports kit a, like a sports hijab um mm -hmm. so things like that the fact that that's only just being brought in now but things like that will massively help um, girls um, to feel you know, included um, so that that's not a barrier. And it was the same for um, in swimming, you know, that I think there's a company Soul Cap to make swimming caps for black women whose hair doesn't fit in a regular size swimming cap. And it's just little things like that that you wouldn't necessarily, well, that I have not been aware of before and that, as companies who maybe make all of these um, accessories, swimming caps for that example, we need to be more aware of not just in our box that we are aware of, and it's actually how is this going to impact on the broader society, and and we need to do everything to stop there being a barrier for anyone in for whatever that means, um, so that we can think more broadly and more diverse, and so things like that hopefully will bring about more awareness, but. I think definitely they, they need to be done. And there'd be so many more examples that, um, that are out there. Yeah, that's definitely something kind of I've never thought of at all. But being able to kind of you have your kit and then being able to kind of match that. Um, exactly. Definitely. Um, in terms of kind of hockey, um, obviously kind of reducing inequalities, it's not just about kind of race and ethnicity it's also about kind of gender equality as well and as you say disabilities um as hockey i think it's great so you guys play all your matches pretty much on the same day kind of back to back so you, it's kind of promote quality definitely Do you think yeah i mean i feel so fortunate um to be in a sport that we are in terms of gender equality um never once have i felt that you know that the men are seen as as better especially in terms of um us as as equals within the organization and governing body of of england and gb hockey we're you know we're paid the same we uh, we are probably one of the most gender equal sports um and and you know that is a great environment to be in um you know things like yeah we we play on the same days is brilliant um and i think it's hard i guess it's maybe because of the sport as a whole isn't as you know highly recognized in terms of sponsorship and things like that that other sort of male sports can bring in more money so then that's why that they they get paid more potentially so you know there's there's reasons why but um it is great that you know we genuinely feel that we are respected as equals to the men within our um, within our governing body. So that is is great. Um, but I do think just across the board, women's sport is isn't regarded as 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 good and, and as successful, which I think is a huge shame. And definitely, you know, so much great work has been done to change that, especially you know campaigns like this girl can and and everything. Getting more uh, publicity about women's sport in in the media and in mainstream media and just constantly being in that public eye and people being able to watch it because like you say if you can't see it you can't be it 
and you know it never stopped me growing up i think i've always had you know hugely supportive parents um and an older brother who I wanted to be like. So, you know, whatever he was doing, I wanted to follow. But never once did my parents say, oh no, you can't do that because you're a girl. And I never felt when I was growing up that there were barriers. And it's only, I guess, when you get older, when you actually are able to reflect and you see that, you know, so many people would have been stopped. And I was a lucky one that, you know, I didn't care if I was called a tomboy because I just wanted to play sport. But actually those negative connotations with so much for young girls wanting to play sport. I think that's so many girls stop playing sport, you know, when they hit puberty, but there's so many negative connotations around being sporty, um, you know, that, that that would be a bad thing or that, you know, that makes you wanting to be like a boy or, or anything like that, that, that I think so much of it can be targeted at that young level so that young girls feel empowered to play sport and such have such positive outcomes with it because we all know the benefits that you can have from sport are amazing and so the fact that some young girls are um, you know pushed away from that when they're younger um is a real shame and that's i think where we need to target a lot of the work and, and so much work is being done there um but just in terms of general activity levels if if girls are stopping you know when they're 15 16 then actually we just we've got really inactive female population uh, from then onwards but you know we have so many more role models now within within mainstream when i grew up i i loved watching all sport but it was predominantly male and lots of my role models were were male um obviously with the uh, with uh, exceptions of people like serena who have obviously been incredible for for women's sport but you know she's come under throughout her career she'd have had so many negative connotations with her with how she looks um you know her strength like if that was a man they she would have been praised to you know no end because of how athletic she is you know how dominant she is but yet yeah, that gets turned because she's a female into aggressive and into domineering and you know that she's too masculine as if you know that, that her strength is a bad thing so i think they're obviously all the challenges that we face um and we are so much further on um, having now so many amazing female role models so that we can empower the next generations of young girls coming through to be able to play. But I think there still needs to be a lot of work on that to make it genuinely equal, like hopefully like we are in hockey um, from an international point of view. So um, yeah, no, definitely still lots to do. Yeah, I think as well with kind of hockey, there's it's not really labelled, is it, as a girl sport or a boys sport? It's it's very kind of gender neutral sport, but in terms of other sports, it's very just the way we've been brought up. Kind of football is a boys sport, rugby is a boys sport. When those barriers really need to be broken down, and I think you need to see more kind of female rugby players and female cricket players on that high platform because they're performing at the same level and kind of reaching the same points as the men in terms of kind of success but yeah. they unfortunately don't it's not perceived in that way or people kind of there'll be one small article and then the mm -hmm. rest will all be kind of male dominated i think getting better at the moment with kind of streaming services and stuff like that um to influence kind of role models in sport to hopefully help younger girls continue playing so Sky Sports, they've started showing netball. Um, there's other streaming services where you can kind of see netball because that's such a, England is such a dominant team in that regards, yet no one really talks about it in the UK or kind of talks about their successes when definitely yeah. they're performing at such a high level and they should get the recognition for that. So yeah, it's definitely kind of breaking down all these gender barriers and just kind of acknowledging sport for and people's successes for what they are regardless of yeah gender or build or anything. yeah exactly and you know we've been so successful the female sport in this country has been incredibly successful we've won the cricket world cup um the netball has won uh, commonwealth gold rugby girls have won the world cup as well the hockey girls obviously won in rio like we are competing at world levels and being hugely successful and exactly that is it's getting better but 
you know, when Chelsea uh, were, won the um, Women's Super League for football, um, obviously with the lockdown, it was this big in the newspaper that Chelsea were crown champions. And yet there was, you know, whole hosts of pages of men's football that wasn't happening or, you know, talking about sport that we couldn't play at that point. And yet we still only get a tiny bit about Chelsea winning. And then obviously when Liverpool win um, the league, don't get me wrong, I'm a huge Liverpool fan, so I was happy to see, you know, all the pages of them. But that just the stark difference between the men's champions and the, the women's champions, that kind of stuff is we need more people. So many women, or so many people watch women's sport. And, you know, the viewing figures for female sport is going up and up. And the fact that the, um, the women's charity shield was on um, just before the men's at Wembley was, was brilliant. Um, you know, the fact that there wasn't even a women's charity shield since 2008, I think it was, um, you know, they, it didn't happen in that time. So then now for it to be um, back on before the men's game um, is brilliant. But then like you say as well, it's just those gender stereotypes that it's called women's football or football or cricket and women's cricket instead of it, like it's always seems to be the the lesser version and that's just how society's um viewed it for so many years so it's breaking down all of those barriers that actually it is a level playing field the women are competing at exactly the same standard as the men and achieving exactly the same if not more in some cases so you know to be actually to celebrate those successes as well i think is key yeah and today and um, well yesterday um the kind of brazilian football team um, yeah. saying that their their female and male athletes are going to be paid the same that's kind of a massive step towards kind of equality and reducing kind of the pay gap that is still prevalent in kind of sport and in life in general yeah exactly and if you think about how big football is in brazil obviously they're a huge footballing nation so to have you know the likes of neymar and Firmino to be to be paid the same as the women to represent their country is a huge step forward. So, um, yeah, brilliant. You know, hopefully more nations will will follow suit and that can be um, rolled out across many nations around the world. In the the recent years, especially with um, gender equality in sport, but it feels like it's quite a mountain to climb with so many sports. You know, in particular football. It's great that the women's super league is. Um, is now funded so it's a professional league funded by Barclays but you know it's still the perceptions I think around it are still so far away from the men's game the fact that we have like league one matches being pay played on on tv but yet it's only just some super league games women's super league games that will be able to be watched mm -hmm. um but we've still yeah positive steps forward but you know, still stuff to be done. Yeah, I saw something recently with um, the Irish rugby team. So they're promoting their new kit and the, the men's kit was all modelled by kind of players, um, whereas the women's kit was all modelled by kind of models. So as a kind of young girl, you, you look at that and you, you don't see kind of the role models or you think, oh, who's that? I'm going to learn about them. I want to be like them. Whereas they're using the faces of their men's players who are kind of well known and people look up to them and then they've not used kind of their female athletes to kind of promote them in the same way as they have the men's. Um, and I think that's kind of a massive shame and kind of a, a kick in the teeth. If you're using your men's stars, why aren't you using your, your female stars? Yeah, 100%. I think we posted, posted that and I was it's just so backward thinking with it. And you think every time we think that we're, we're doing well and moving forward, something like that comes out. And then it's just, it's every time you're made to feel like you're not as good as them, or it's always the lesser version and that we're always still competing to be on an equal playing field when, you know, so much of the sport is played at, at the highest level. So it should be, respected in the same way that the men's equivalent of the sport is, res is respected um you know we've had in it it just goes back from history um you know that the women's sport was always it was women's sport back in the day like real really far back in history was was great like women's football 
was really successful and then it was banned by the FA in 1921 for 50 years it was banned for, in the FA um, you know during war periods where women needed to be looking after the households or you know helping with the war effort that you know it then that carried on and that then they weren't able to to carry on playing and then it wasn't until um something like 80 years later that actually the fa apologized for um for banning the women for that long so you know we were having to compete with not playing the game not being allowed to play the game for 50 years so of course you know some bits might be slightly further behind but actually you know we've got this far having not been played for 50 years so imagine what the girls of today growing up with all the opportunities that they can have what kind of talent that they're going to produce so we need to carry on in that trajectory and and gain the respect that that women's sport fully deserves um because you know some of the talent out there across so many different sports for the women is outstanding and amazing to watch um and i think it's always seen when i think that's why the olympics is so great is because you know everybody gets exposed to so many sports that they wouldn't normally see or wouldn't be interested in but everyone gets hooked on every single sport going and so many of the women's sports get view viewing figures you know that are outstanding and just to take rio as an example um for the the hockey girls they had nine million people watching the semi-final and the final both had over like nine million people watching so you know people do get interested in it and it is amazing to watch it's just getting those viewing figures in there regularly and and exposing it to um to the society and having the media want to show it um because the interest is there um we just need to be able to maintain it and for people to respect that you know the level of that sport is fantastic yeah nine nine million people crazy cancel the news, <laughs> <laughs> the news. yeah i remember sitting and watching it and yeah kind of everyone even people who i play hockey but kind of even people who aren't interested in hockey or even sport in general i think when you see a team being so successful everyone kind of gets gets behind them and watches them so it's definitely something we need more of kind of it's more of that exposure i think they like say yeah because and obviously it, it helps that it's successful you know, you know don't get me wrong if um the, our world cup was incredible and the amount of people that came was fun like it was just mind-blowing i remember running out for that first game that we had and you know all the pyrotechnics going up and the stand was huge it went on for days they, they'd extended it um and i genuinely had like goosebumps all over and it was a feeling i have never had running out on a hockey pitch just the sheer volume of people and you know everyone wanting you to do so well as a squad because obviously it was a home games um it was then obviously unfortunate that we weren't actually very successful in that obviously losing in the uh, quarterfinal to holland um so obviously the the more successful you are if we'd you know got to the final of that tournament we would have probably been able to make huge headlines and um and generate much more media, media interest so that success is needed to be able to um to gain that the media coverage to a certain extent um but i think you know when it is shown so the the cricket world cup women's cricket the the netballers um with their home world cup as well um you know actually so many people were watching all of those events um and get behind it and it's we just don't want to make them you know once every four years or once in a blue moon if we can get them regularly on the tv for people to watch or go down and make it easy for them if they're um playing in this country then to make that accessible then then that's crucial as well yeah and not just kind of watching it on tv kind of getting people involved and going to games and as you say the world cup you put on and i went to the finals and the stadium was massive bigger bigger than it's kind of ever been um but that's great it's showing that more people are taking an interest and in wanting to go see live sport and like we said earlier kind of I know that was the women's world cup but your regular games you have them back to back so just getting the people in and young people I know kind of GB hockey you do some initiatives where you get 
kind of school kids in and watching sport live is it's just incredible and giving people those opportunities to go and watch a sport they maybe didn't even think of and it kind of changes their perceptions and makes them want to start playing start picking up a stick and hopefully that's where you get kind of all the kind of ethnic minorities who wouldn't particularly be exposed to it getting them exposed and getting them excited to play not just hockey but kind of all sports in general yeah definitely I mean I might be biased but there's nothing like live sport no matter what it is you know I would happily go and watch like any sport going live I think there's just an incredible feeling around it so as a youngster yeah especially if you're you know sporty anyway then getting exposed to different sports and like you say I think it's really important um that we get kids from all sorts of backgrounds um and you know in more deprived areas giving them the opportunity to come and watch live sport because you know it's it's not cheap coming to watch some of the hockey games um so we need to then have um ways to make it accessible giving out free tickets to to schools like you said i think is a really good way of of getting that exposure to people who wouldn't normally be able to um and yeah just making sure that everybody has the opportunity to see it because i think once you experience watching it live like you said like you'd be hooked straight away and if you're not fine but you know even if there's those couple of kids that that do and then see one you know a particular person maybe on the pitch that they've they were amazed by or just the whole team spirit and being part of that team I mean that's why I play hockey but sport in particular team sports is because for me I get the most joy about being around my teammates and winning together there's no better feeling than winning as a team because you know you've all done it together and all that hard work that you've put in all those hours that then when you actually succeed and you celebrate you do it it feels so much better just celebrating all together and then if you lose then you're you're in it together as well and there's no you know blame there's no one person's the reason for success and no one person's the reason for failure and for me you know I wouldn't be I don't think I would be able to be in an individual sport in just that I thrive get so much energy of being in a team so you know as youngsters to be able to see that and have that enjoyment of it you know you don't have to be aspiring to be a GB hockey player you might just like that you're being able to be active and be with friends and get so much enjoyment from that and that's brilliant and if kids can enjoy being active healthy and playing sport with friends then you know that is the fundamentals of all of all sport and if we can do that and get as many of them into that as possible then you know that's great foundations to work from yeah definitely with kind of the whole team aspect of kind of team sports you you're working together it doesn't matter at all your age your gender your anything it just when you're on the pitch they are your team and they're your equal and I think that's just one of the great things about sport in general is you are all there for a purpose to play sport you do it because you love it and kind of nothing else really matters so I think in hockey as well it's amazing because if you look at our squad and it's quite funny when you go into, when you go to multi-sport events. So for example, at the Commonwealth, when we went into the dining room, it was funny because you can sort of guess the sport slightly in terms of, you know, you walk in the basketball players are up here and, you know, all sorts of different sports and certain body types do lend themselves better to, to different sports. And then you, nobody could place us as hockey players. They sort of would always ask like, Oh, what sport are you guys? Um, because, we have Unzi, who is, you know, five foot, whatever, down here. And then Giselle, who's nearly six foot kind of thing. So you have, no matter what your body type, you can play hockey. It, you're, it's so inclusive in that sense. So there really shouldn't be any barriers for anybody wanting to take part. You know, if you're super speedy, great. That is a, a huge asset to have. If you're really strong, that's also an amazing asset to have. So, it, you know, one strength doesn't mean that uh you know if you don't have that you can't play um so yeah there's so many reasons as well why i think hockey in particular is such a great team sport um for that and you know there should be no excuse for for people to feel like they can't come in so we need to make sure that we make it an environment where there are no barriers to anybody wanting to play 
Uh, thanks, Sarah, for chatting with us today about goal 10 um, to do with reducing inequalities in sport. Thanks I, so much. It was a pleasure to be on. Um, thanks so much. No worries. Enjoy your fitness training. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>